What's up, what's up? It's time for Done Way Past Funny. With your host, G.D. Fenderson. Join us as we take a look back at the early works of seasoned comedians before they were seasoned with this week's guest, the legend, Harry Kurtz. It's time to get down and get dope with Gunway Past Funny. Hi, and welcome to Dunway Past Funny. I'm your host, G.D. Fenderson, certified forensic humorist at large, but I'm losing weight. Um, <laughs> Our guest for this episode is the legend, Perry Kurtz. How's it going, Perry? Doing really well. Glad to be here. Uh, if you don't mind, let the people know a little bit about yourself, how long you've been doing comedy, uh, where you're located, and how they can get a hold of you if they want to book you. All right. Well, I am living in Los Angeles, currently living in my own apartment. I just moved in. I have my own apartment for the first time in 44 years. And uh, let's see, I have been married now for 33 years in a row, but I've been separated for 12. So I've been happy for 12 years. But <laughs> I started being a comedian way back in elementary school. The, what really happened, what made me feel that I was funny is my father was going to hit me, hit my little brother, and he said, do I have to take off my belt? And I said, that'd be good because it's smaller than your hand. And he laughed and he walked out of the room and something hit me. I said, wow, funny works. When you, they're laughing, they're not angry. And I started being funny and I became very, very popular at school. And it turns out when you're small and you're cute and you're funny, girls like you and there's really no downside to that <laughs> so i started being funny in school and all my friends kept saying you should be a comedian you should be a comedian because i was a storyteller something happened i would explain everything and the key to telling a story is give them images yeah. So they can see what you're talking about. Give them smells. Tell them about the birds, the trees rustling in back of you. If you can generate images, it gives it strength to the material. And so one day in 73, we went to New Jersey to a bar called the Crazy Horse Saloon in Barrington, New Jersey. And they were having a talent show. Talent and so they said we're going to enter you so i said all right i got up there and i just told three stories one was about driving down there one was about my brother another one was about my mother and my father and i won 150 dollars. cool and i said that was easy so i quit my job where i was making a lot a lot of money. I was making like 140 grand a year. Now, was that a, like a book, not a bookstore? Uh, and I forgot where you. Uh, a religious publishing house. Religion, yes, religious publishing. Yes. It was books and illustrations and pamphlets for foreign missionaries. So I had to read the Bible and illustrate. Jesus, all of his cronies in full color, riding horses, sitting and having meals, him being put up to the cross. And we didn't have C CGI. I had this talent to illustrate and make it look like a photograph. Okay. So I had to draw this in real life with watercolors. Wow. No outlines. Everything was modeled. And watercolor is like probably the most difficult medium to paint. Yes, it is. I was, I was a media freak in art school. I was teaching people how to use watercolors to make it look like oils and all this other stuff. I've always been into that. So I moved up quickly. I started out as an assistant art director, moved up to the art director has made a lot of money. And so I quit my job and I had about 65 grand in the bank. Now this is in 73. Yeah, yeah. So we multiply that times like five or six. And I lived on that until 79. And when I was down to my last $200, I moved to San Francisco with my other electric guitar, which was a 74 Gibson SG mahogany with a big speed tailpiece. 
And I moved out there and got started with no, nothing. Moved in with some women I met at a club, you know, which was not bad. You know, it's hard to sleep at night because they kept coming in. And um, <laughs> started doing it there. And then I met Robin Williams and started doing improv with him. And uh, all the biggies, um, I have a picture of me and Robin and uh, Harry Anderson from Night Court and Kevin Pollack. And uh, now this is the pre suspender Robin Williams that you met. Yeah, I met Robin in 74. I went out there just to see what San Francisco was like. And I was wearing suspenders, I've been wearing them since 68. And he says, oh, I love the suspenders. Why do you wear them? I said, because I don't like anything squeezing my waist. I hate to be restrained. I'm not good with rules. He goes, oh, my God, I'm the same way. Next day, he shows up in suspenders. <laughs> and then two days later, Harry Anderson told me that Robin told him that he liked my suspenders. And he started to wear them from that point on. Says, you're, you're responsible for the iconic uh, Mork, and or Mork and Mindy look. Yeah. Yep, it's true. Yeah, he was, um, we were very close. I used to, he, he was uncomfortable being alone. He grew up by himself. His father was the CEO of Lincoln Motor Car. And they traveled 45 weeks a year with the nanny. And he was not allowed to play with other children. All he had was to start with was 300 green plastic army men. Do you remember those little yeah, things? Yeah, yeah, he had yeah. 300. When he died, he had 4,800. But each one had a name and a personality and characteristics. And that's where all these voices came from, from being alone in his room. Right. His bedroom, he had a 12-foot tall miniaturized Hummer in his bedroom which had 24 foot ceilings in the house. And we used to go to his house as, as parents moved out. And we used to go and get up in the, in the Hummer and drive around the bedroom. He also yeah. had a two mile lake, a private lake. We used to go and get in these little pontoon boats and knock each other off. And, <laughs> but because he wasn't allowed to play with anybody, he could not handle being alone. And he had to always be making peel, people laugh to make himself feel good. So that's where he got it from. Right. Always. Now, now you were, okay, it's, well, it's, you were, actually both of us, that's a, a few things we had in common. We both were strippers. Did you know Natalie? I, she got me started as a stripper. Oh, no, there you go. So, but I'm, of course, I'm East Coast, and I knew the East Coast Natalie. You knew the West Coast Natalie. Yeah. So, so which actually were you a stripper before you got to San Francisco? Or no, that? when I got when I got to San Francisco, um, I was there for about three weeks, and I met the guy who was the manager of the Condor, which is a major strip club on Broadway. It it had Carol Dota. She was the first female stripper in the country to get implants. Oh, okay. And so the club was always packed. So I got a job as the door guy. I was the bar right now. Hey, come on in. We got strippers, male strippers. We got a guy's going to come down on a piano and split a woman in half. I got people out of buses by doing pantomime. And I was getting 150 a night. Then one night, the guy of the male female strip act was sick and they asked me if I could fill in for him. I said, well, I know I could take his place. I don't know if I can fill anything. <laughs> and so we did it as a parody. Okay. Carol Dota entered the stage through a hole in the ceiling and she came down on a piano. There's a, a white grand piano and it came down from the ceiling and I was, I would MC. I'd bring people in. I'd MC the show, go out, bring more people and see them. And I go, all right, we got a guy's going to come down and he's going to split a woman in half. Watch carefully. Then I go off and then I would come down and I'd look around the room and I go, it's me. <laughs> and she would reach up my pants and she would stroke me a little bit. And then she pulled my zipper down. I get caught and I would jump and I would fix it. And I jump off the piano and then she pulled my pants down 
and I'm wearing bright blue underwear and she pulled them down. Now I'm wearing green. Now I'm wearing yellow. And she pulled them in. I had on nine pairs of underwear. I said, it's, like, it's like the old hanky thing. Up the exactly. Yeah. And I chased her around the stage with my pants around my ankle and ankles. And she finally laid down on her back. And when I went to climb on her, we both had G strings on. When I went to climb on her, she closed her knees on me. <laughs> and finally I said, will you please stop? And she left them open and she closed them again. And I jumped up. I said, fine. And I go, get out of here. And she walked off the stage. I go, all right, let's get back to our regular show. I went back. And then one night he said, listen, um, the lady who hosts the male strip show doesn't want to do it anymore. Would you like that job? And I said, okay. And cool. paid a lot of money. And I did the same thing. I would, I would strip. I'd get caught in my zipper, strange underwear. I would jump into the audience. I wear an oversized shirt. And I go into the audience, put my shirt over women's heads. So you couldn't see what they were doing under the shirt. So was there anything in particular that you learned from stripping that you carried over into into comedy? Or, well, actually, because well, your comedy, did you start? You didn't start off stand up. You started off with music parodies or. Yeah, when I started doing comedy and I was going on the road, I had a guitar and I was doing song parodies. I was still doing stand up, but the majority of it was guitar like. uh the Pink Floyd song, We Don't Need No Edgy. Well, I did. Right. It was a, it's about San Francisco. We don't need no contraception. A quick blow job in the doorway. <laughs> Tourists leave that fag alone. <laughs> and, and it got applause. And so I was doing that stuff and I think I had like five songs and in the beginning I was doing about, I think I was middling. So I was doing 30 minutes okay. and then this comic told me who a, a guitar comic whose whole act was songs told me, you know, you're funny. You don't need the guitar anymore. And I never realized that I was direct competition for him. I'll say he's, it sounds to me like he's just trying to get rid of you. Bingo. Uh, yeah. No more calls. That's, yep. that's, see, that's that, was, that was where I went to. I was like, wait a second, because comedians aren't usually that kind and helpful. <laughs> no. And, you know, it, it didn't even occur to me. But after like a month or two and I saw that I was writing jokes every day, I realized I didn't need the guitar. And then 25 years ago, I found my guitar in a local market over the freezer section. Have you ever looked up over the freezer? <laughs> Well, I've never found a guitar at over. Free. I did. I, when I was there, I found an eleven slice toaster, not 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 ten, not twelve, eleven slices, two slots of five, and one more at the top. All like right. this guy was just drinking, said, "I'll just add another one for my buddy, whatever." <laughs> so I was shopping, and I looked up and went, "What the hell is that? That's a guitar, like a keyboard thing." And I bought it was twenty five dollars, man. And it's programmable. It's got three memories in it, so you can record three different songs in there. Now, is and, it sensitive? Like when you, the harder you hit, or is it no? Back no, okay. it's not like a real piano. It's no. It's whatever you touch. That's what it is. You can control vibrato and echo on the buttons, and then it's got a thing where you can stretch the notes and bend the notes. Okay, like a little wheel or something. Right, like a little pull wheel up near your left hand. Yeah. And so I would show, hey, let, let me show you what I do. And I just hit it and be going, dum, 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 dum. It sounds like a whole band. And then yeah. I play a couple notes and I go, and the crowd laughs. They go, all right, now we're going to do Louie Louie. And I go, right. the way you sing is Louie Louie, oh, baby, we got to go now. I, 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 I. Right. And I start playing and I start making up a song about my audience. This is how I clo close my shows. And I start making up about this lady sitting up front. This guy's got his feet up on the table. She's telling him to move. He doesn't know if he's able. GD's looking down. He's looking at his notes. Yes, I'm I up am. here right now. I'm taking and, notes. I'm taking notes. And I'm notes. thinking of my goats, you know. So I would do that. And then at the end of the song, I would pick it up and I play the lead to Louie Louie on the guitar with my tongue. 
Uh, 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 and the crowds go nuts. I did that at a senior show, and a 94-year-old lady stood up and yelled, You're my ride home. <laughs> and I said, No, I'm not. <laughs> So sometimes I take that to jam. Sometimes I take my guitar. I sit in with bands as much as I can. I love doing that. I, I, I have to be creative. It's like you can barely see the walls, but my 18-year-old child is going to be coming back here on the 17th of April. So I get pictures of them all around the room I got probably 40 pictures up on the wall now the 18 year old is that the daughter that used to do comedy with you yes she was seven? okay right Does she still do comedy no now, now she's a k she's a k-pop dancer okay k-pop is korean rock and roll right right like, uh, BTS. like BTS. yeah she was at their concert a friend of mine bought a ticket for his daughter she didn't want to go the, her, his daughter and mine were the same age. He said, I'll give her a ticket. And she sat in like the eighth row for BTS. Okay. So BTS, their dancing is, is a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. So she, but she dances just like me only three times as fast. Okay. And one of her instructors, when she started going to classes, they always let her in because she had the moves down. She had the timing and the dynamics. Dynamics means going from barely any moving to a hot movement. So yeah. from gentle to strong. And they asked her, where did you learn to dance? She said, I don't know. And I said, so what happened? She said, well, I asked mom where I learned to dance. And mom said that, your dad taught you to dance when you were five years old. And she said, I looked at mom and said, I don't fucking remember being five years old. <laughs> so now Riley, as is the name they use, is uh, coming back to go to some K-pop shows. Last summer, she danced at the anime convention at LA Live. And okay. I think there was like 21,000 people watching her. Cool. Just amazing. So she'll be staying here. And uh, I mean, this is an adult show, right? What we're doing here. Can I? Yeah, you can, say, you can say anything right. you want. And, and she, if there's anything you don't, if you, anything you say that you kind of like, you change your mind about saying, let me know and I'll edit it out later. All right. Well, she's coming back and she said, uh, you know, you're not going to be banging bitches in the bedroom while I'm sleeping, are you? And I said, no, I'll take him out on the patio. I was going to say sofa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got a really nice sofa here, very oh, comfortable, yeah. and the cushions are held on with Velcro, so oh, you can okay. take the cushions off, and you got the same size as a twin bed. Yeah. So she's comfortable. She said she doesn't need a doesn't need a, a sheet around it because I'll be sitting here on the computer. That's the right in back of me. She said, "No, I don't need that," and uh, maybe you could block the light from the the window. But uh, can't wait for Riley to get here. I haven't seen her since uh, October 31st, they left. So she'll be staying with me for a week. Then she'll be staying with her friends. And then she'll be back in 2024. Okay. So do you have any children that you know of? Um, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any biological children. I have children I've helped raise, uh, you know, stepson, step, um, stepchildren, things like that, but none of my own. I don't. I don't. It's not legal for me to actually procreate. Um, I, it's, it, well, with a face like that, I understand. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. It was like, I'm amazed they let you broadcast. <laughs> well, it was supposed to have been audio only, but I bought. I found this camera. I was like, "Wait a minute! It comes with a camera." Whoa! Yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I married a woman that had three kids that didn't know their fathers, and um, they had all moved in with me. And I got to, I fell in love with them. And then one day at dinner, I put a ring on everybody's finger and I said, "I'd like to ask the four of you to marry me." And my son said, "Yeah, Dad. Whatever. Can we just have dinner?" 
<laughs> and we got married at City Hall. It was very boring. No big wedding or anything like that. We actually went on the road for two years as a family so I could do comedy. And that was some of the best two years of my life because we had so much fun. And they were just like little comics. They'd stay up till three or four in the morning <laughs> and they would sleep until we'd wake them up because we had to drive to another city. No. Um, no I'm trying, what was the next one? Here? Now, I guess we all had, um, being in comedy, like I had um, family members I probably started making laugh before I actually, you know. Right. So who was your hardest person to make laugh? You know, so, you know, you had to work the hardest to make them laugh so that when you got that laugh, you knew that you'd done something right. I would say my grandmother. My grandfather was basically funny. He was also musical. Okay. He played piano and he got me into music. So um, he interested me there. And he was naturally funny too. Uh, for those watching, naturally funny means you're just funny automatically. You don't have to make an effort at it. It just comes out. And he was that way. But his wife just would look at me and go, <laughs> you know, and you want to say, just give me the finger, all right? <laughs> you know. So that's good training for when you actually are live and you have those audience members. Sometimes they sit right up front. Oh, they God. Give you, they give you nothing. It's like nothing. Well, I love hecklers. Oh, okay. I just love them. There is a club down in Compton where I've been told, park near the club. You don't want to be walking down the street by yourself at night. It's a very – it's this color. Everybody is black. Like, you're light-skinned compared to what's down there. <laughs> <laughs> and no white comics except me. And I have this piece I wrote opening for uh, Paul Mooney. Right. Um, we had been, we'd done a lot of weeks on the road and I was a laugh factor in one night and he would do an hour and a half show. And his whole act is the dumb things that white people and black people say, but he uses the N word constantly. And so the place was packed. He did an hour and a half and nobody wanted to follow him. And I said, I followed Robin Williams 13 times. I followed Dangerfield nine. You know, I'll follow him. I walked down the steps and everybody went. And I just stood there and I said, ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for that big dick N word? And I put now, I'm 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 a little bit confused there because you because you did that for a while for like what was it nine months you followed him was yeah it nine weeks nine months yeah so when I don't see, so he's the headliner he goes up for like ninety minutes or an hour whatever he does he does his thing and then after he's done you're you're like the anti fluffer right right well because there was still a crowd there. He wanted to get the money off them, and he knew they would stay as long as there was a show. So he would put up two or three comics after him. Okay. Well, he so we two were, or three after him. If you're doing an hour, he, he's saving money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Paul had draw. Everybody knew who he was. I mean, he was writing for Richard Pryor and all these other people. He was very well known and a wonderful wonderful kind person we had so much fun on the road he was great and um when after the first show I, basically for those watching i said i would say the n-word and i go oh i'm sorry i can't believe i said n-word i'm not allowed to say n-word i'm a white guy we can't i said it again i'm sorry i can't help i'm you know we can't i grew up in west philadelphia i was an n-word we can't say that i said it again i'm sorry lighten up come on you're an n-word i'm sorry i mean nigga come on i'm sorry and the crowds went nuts after the second, third time. They were screaming and jumping up and down because of the shock effect. They couldn't believe that I had the balls to say that. And yeah. after the show, Malcolm Jamal Warner from the Cosby That's show, the show. Yeah. walked up to me and said, man, you got some big motherfucking balls to say that. He said, but that was funny. That was really funny. Now, Gave me one of two handshakes. Now, 
I, when, when was this? The reason why I'm asking is because, okay, I'm not, I don't believe in PC. Okay. I don't believe in bad words. I just believe in bad intentions. Yes. So I, I don't have a, like, as far as I'm concerned, if anybody wants to say nigger, they can say nigger. I don't care. Cause it's, 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 it's just, it's, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, kike, nigger, spick, I don't care because it's not for me, it's the intention. But somewhere along the line, society has decided, even in a setting like comedy, which is right. opposed, to, I mean, I could see, I could almost see going to a restaurant and you can't call people those names. I can yeah. see going into school, you can't call people those names. I can see politicians. I cannot understand entertainment and comedy because in music, they're still doing it. Yeah. Music, they're still doing it. It's just that comedians. Well, well, I'm not gonna because I'm not gonna speak for you. I still use the I'll use any word I want, in you know, it, um, and I say any word I want because there's some words I won't use, and it's not because of society. It's because I don't want to. If my wife's in the audience, I don't want that long ride home. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Other than that, and, and cause I don't like I don't like having to explain things. You know. Yeah. Because it's not because like I don't intentionally try to insult people. Yeah, but I do intentionally try to enlighten people. That's on purpose. Well, I, I agree with you completely. I'm the same word, same way. There are, you know, um, like I said, I, I grew up in West Philadelphia and that was all black for eight miles in any direction. Right. So I was an N word. We used the word all the time right. and nobody was offended by it because it was just part of our lingo. Right. We, we were that, but then you know it became a bad word and i understand that because it was used by people saying get out of here and they would say right. they would use so, it in so a oppressed. negative in an hateful right. way yeah. yes and that's when it became wrong and people cannot differentiate between that because if somebody walks in and you go what's up man and you say that that's not being mean but right. if somebody says get out of here and they use the word then it's the same thing as like calling somebody an asshole. And that's society. And I don't understand why that's happened. I really don't. I know that I still, I can't say the word. I don't know why it's happened in comedy. That's, I don't understand yeah. why it's happening in comedy. I can understand it in open society and polite society. I don't understand it in, in comedy, which is the very purpose of comedy is to expose, enlighten, and push the envelope. That's and right. You can't push the envelope if they're telling you, well, you can't even open the envelope, let alone push it. <laughs> uh, this is an envelope-free zone. I'm sorry. No envelopes. Postcards only. <laughs> Don't open that here, please. Yeah, that's, okay. what PC, that's what PC stands for, postcards. You can only have the postcards, no envelopes. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes no sense to me why it became so taboo to use a word that is part of our language and can be used in a pleasant way until somebody decides not to, especially in a forum where you're up there making jokes. If you get up there and you call someone an asshole, you're still calling them an asshole. Right. But that's okay. Yeah. Now I know that <laughs> I have a, a bit about, cause um, I'm like you, well, I consider myself a humorist and not a comedian. Right. Uh, and, I, and basically, I think the, the difference is a comedian says, look at me, laugh at me. And a humorist says, look at the world, let's laugh at it together. Yeah. You know, so that's, I mean, that's the distinction in my mind. And so when, when I was a kid, my mother, um, there's two things that my mother did that ruined me as a, a black man. One was to teach me proper English. <laughs> that got my ass whooped a lot. <laughs> yeah, in school, no, you don't yeah. want to. Speak. Yeah. No, don't speak properly around here. Yeah, and, motherfucker. And the, yeah, that's it. And, and the other thing was, and now and this, and that's the, that's the, my my mother and I. I mean, my mother um, lectured us once. My my brother got mad. My, my brother and I were punished, and we were sitting in the room. Okay, for people, let, let my back for a second. Anybody wants to see the routine, look it up on my first DVD. Right now, I'm just talking to a friend of mine, and we're just, just a discussion. If you want to see the routine, check out the routine on my first DVD. There, said it. Now, <laughs> so my my brother and I had done something wrong. I was raised, I was the youngest. 
I was the youngest and, and I was also the designated snitch. Um, so we got in trouble. We wound up being punished and my brother was mad at me and he called me a, a motherfucker with the V. Okay. So I got, I went to my mother and I told on him cause I wanted to see him get beat cause he was always beating me. I want to see him get beat. Oh. So I told my mother and my mother comes in the room and instead of beating him, she gives him a lecture. She goes, you call, what you call your brother? And you know, kids do this when you ask, when you catch him, you say, what did you say? And they go, that's what he did. He said, what you say? Okay, <laughs> and what? Oh, motherfucker. She goes, it's mother fucker. It's a T H in it. And she gave him a, she wrote him, gave him a lecture about wow. not the fact that he called me that, but the way he called me that. And I was oh, so angry. Oh, that's funny. I was so angry because I wanted him to get a beating, not a lecture. Right. And said he was educated. Yes, yes. Which didn't matter because when he got back into the street, he said it the same way anyway. Of course. I was the only one that was dumb enough to talk the way my mother told us to talk in the public. So. Dumbass motherfucker. <laughs> so. Hi, I'm G.D. Fenderson, served by Friends of Kim Race at Large, but I'm losing weight. This has been part one of our interview with the legendary Perry Kurtz. Join us for part two. And when you come back, bring a friend.